We are now ready to start uh, the next session, session number six. Welcome back after um, a rather quick lunch. So this uh, session is uh, challenges in achieving sustainable development goals, the SDG one, which is on no poverty, and SDG two on the zero hunger challenge in hilly and coastal regions. So I invite uh, Dr. Israel um, Oliver King to coordinate the session for us and invite the speakers onto the dais. Good afternoon. <clears throat> so, we are in session six, challenges in achieving sustainable development goal, SDG one. SDG one, no poverty and SDG two, no zero hunger in hilly and coastal regions. So, <clears throat> for this uh, session, uh, 
we have uh, Dr. Narayana Hegde, our trustee, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. And we have uh, five eminent speakers, and uh, four of them are online, and uh, Dr. Gopinath is here. So uh, let me first of all uh, introduce uh, uh, the chair of the session, uh, Dr. Uh, Narayan Hegde. Um, <coughs> Uh, he is uh, um, expert in the area of animal husbandry, forestry and rural development and he is also a chair of uh, the Bay Foundation and current uh, trustee of uh, uh, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. <coughs> he has uh, received uh, degrees and post uh, degrees from uh, different institutions. His doctorate is from, uh, uh, from Hawaii. and. Um, he studied in uh, management of agriculture from IAM Ahmedabad and, <coughs> and he has served in uh, several uh, uh, cent federal government uh, initiatives related to animal husbandry, forestry and rural development. Thank you sir uh, for accepting to chair this session. And uh, I will introduce uh, each speakers a little later and, uh, and this session uh, will be about uh, for about uh, two hours and uh, each speaker will have about 10 minutes time to make that presentation and we will have about 20 minutes for uh, questioning and uh, discussion uh, at the end of uh, all the speakers. So um, uh, floor is yours sir please for, m for the moderation. Good afternoon. Before uh, inviting the speakers, let me briefly introduce the topic. This is to address uh, the poverty and uh, zero hunger in hilly and coastal areas. I have been working uh, in this field for almost uh, four decades. And uh, my observation has been that uh, among all the ecosystems, both hilly areas and coastal ecosystems are uh, very special and more difficult uh, because uh, of uh, the type of communities. They are the most deprived communities, either scheduled tribes or fishermen, basic deprived of education, basic needs. They are prone to the natural vagaries more frequently than any other communities, either floods or droughts. They have very see serious problem of employment, seasonal employment. As a result, both these uh, communities are compelled to migrate to different places. As a result, it affects their uh, health, education, children's growth. That leads to perpetual or chronic uh, poverty. Further, they are uh, in remote areas, access, poor access to communication, infrastructure, and as a result, they have, and uh, they also have lack of uh, people's organization or infrastructure which is required for the basic needs. That is one of the, these are, these are the reason why most of our efforts, most of our technologies developed for the poor in the hilly and coastal areas are not able to show the results because you know if you don't address these you know generic issues you know it will be very difficult let me take two minutes to say what happened when we were uh, promoting tribal development through horticulture we realized that the men are alcoholic so we had to deal with women when we started dealing with women either they were sick or the children were sick so they were not able to come and attend to the work so unless you address the problem of the women, empower them with good health and nutrition, it was extremely difficult to make the project successful. Unfortunately, many times when you have go to the donors, particularly the department, we are so much set sector centric that if it is a horticultural project, you won't even get one rupee for, from the health department to address their health or education. 
So the point here I'm trying to raise is, it's a very complex issue unless you bring a multidisciplinary team to address these multiple questions, single-handed technology effort may not be able to get the mileage what we expect. So what is uh, the thumb rule solution? Probably you need to make sure that they have, every, every time they have food excess, you know, so that they have some food banks so that, you know, whenever make effort, suddenly calamities come, can we, they can't keep on begging. They should have at least basic food for them to survive. You should have access to resources and credit. You should have access to technology and uh, infrastructure. And uh, kind of hand-holding is very important. So my feeling is, unless you address these things, probably through people's organization, mentoring, and uh, looking to the value chain development for all the production, Many times with all the good technologies and well-intended scientists, we may not get the speed of developments. So with that, let me uh, invite, I'm sure our uh, learned speakers uh, take note of this or address these issues, particularly women empowerment, you know, handholding. Uh, and I will invite the first speaker. Thank you very much. Um. Thank you, thank you, sir, for that uh, introductory remarks. So let me now call upon uh, Dr. Uh, Piyush Rani, who is the uh, executive director of uh, NESFAS. NESFAS is a non-governmental organization working in uh, Shillong, Northeast Slow Food and Agrobiodiversity Society. <coughs> and uh, Dr. Piyush is the executive director and uh, basically is a social scientist and uh, uh, he belongs to the Kasi community and uh, he played a very critical role in terms of establishing agro agroecology learning circles. Uh, it's an innovation platform of NESFAS and uh, he'll be sharing uh, his insights in the area of promoting traditional knowledge and contemporary agroecology practices in that region in the context of how they have been addressing uh, SDG 1 and 2. Over to you. Uh, Piyush, Piyush, you will have 10 minutes or so, maximum 12 minutes, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Oliver. So let me just share the screen. Can you see the screen? Just confirm. Uh, okay, yes, thank yes, you. Piyush, yeah. So, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. G. N. Hari uh, Haran, you know, and Dr. Oliver for inviting me to be part of this international conference. Uh, in my presentation, I'm going to share some of our journey with the communities here in Northeast India uh, that, that have helped in localizing the SDG 1 and 2. Uh, uh, for the past 10 years as an organization, uh, we have been actively working towards uh, defending and strengthening these indigenous uh, people food systems. So uh, during uh, uh, 2015, the Indigenous Partnership, uh, which is a Rome-based agency in collaboration with, uh, with us here in, in, in Northeast India, along with the National Institute of Nutrition and Center for Indigenous People, uh, Nutrition and Environment from McGill University, Canada, so uh, we conducted a study uh, basically to examine the prevalence of the nutrition and chronic disease among the Kasi here in Meghalaya. So this is the, the, the finding as you can see in the screen. So uh, where, you know, like the standing rate is 57% uh, and then wasting is 10% and then the other rate uh, is 31% among the children, you know, uh, under five years. And then if you can also see into the, the you know, the, the anemia, you know, among, you know, uh, the children is 68%. And then even among, you know, like pregnant uh, women, you know, this is also, you know, very, very high. So, you know, this is like the pandemic of uh, hidden hunger, you know, that we can, that we can really see into this context. So, um, therefore, you know, the, 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 study, uh, the study suggests that, you know, um, uh, I mean, one of the core questions that being raised, you know, when we, when we did this study is that, you know, uh, child under nutrition and micronutrient deficiencies, you know, are, are, are you know, and acceptably high among Kasi in West Kasi uh, hills of Meghalaya, despite, you know, the rich biodiversity that we have. So therefore, you know, the study, study suggests, you know, the three key major areas, you know, that we need to look into that. So number one is that uh, 
we need to uh, develop a community based strategies you know so that you know we are able to utilize the local biodiversity that we have and then the second thing also you know to look into the nutritional potential of the kasi food system that we have here uh, especially the the compositional analysis of the plan here and then also you know to look into the education and behavior change uh, you know uh, communication among the people here you know for better food intake then so uh, uh, in uh, 2018, uh, uh, you know, all the way, you know, till now, then with the support of uh, REC funded initiative. So we work with uh, 102 villages in Meghalaya and uh, uh, 28 villages in, in Nagaland. So the, the project is No One Shall Be Left Behind initiative, which is basically addressing, you know, this concern, you know, that, that we have. So uh, under this uh, project, you know, uh, we have the, the four major components, which is basically like a very holistic and kind of approach. We are looking, you know, from the production, from the consumption, from the livelihood, and then also, you know, like uh, to introduce some of, of the innovative uh, activities that, you know, that we would like, you know, to address while dealing, you know, with the communities. I also, you know, um, uh, agree, you know, with the fact, you know, because, you know, this requires, you know, like a, like a multiple, multiple teams, you know, to address, you know, the issue that we are talking about here. So uh, let me share some of the, some of the good practices uh, and then the strategies and innovations which we have been doing here, which uh, receive a lot of uh, positive feedbacks, you know, from the communities and other stakeholders. So, um, so the first thing that we do is the, the participatory mapping exercise. Uh, on the on average, uh, there are more than uh, 200, you know, food plants per village. So then with the help of people like nutritionists, we try to find out, you know, the nutritional value of around 85, you know, common local species, which we develop uh, like a simple poster like this one here. So basically, you know, to encourage, uh, you know, like the communities to eat uh, or, you know, to respect or to appreciate, you know, their own local food. Um, our idea here also is to change the mindset of local communities so that, you know, they are able to appreciate their own local food and try to expand or revive such unique species within their own uh, small kitchen gardens. So we did in the form of a campaign, which we call the production plan campaign. So um, while doing this initiative, uh, we also need to uh, uh, tap into the local knowledge and combine, you know, with the contemporary knowledge on some of the emerging issues in different areas like soil, seed, and pest. So therefore, you know, through the agroecology learning circles, this has become a great platform for our farmers to come together and exchange ideas and solutions over a cup of tea that will bring benefit, you know, to their own farming systems. So this is basically, you know, very important, you know, for us because it's like farmer to farmer, you know, uh, exchange knowledge happening. And um, it does not end there. We also uh, need to see how such diverse knowledge system, you know, pass on to the young generations. So therefore, you know, we introduced an innovative idea called the Acro Biodiversity Walk. In this process, uh, the knowledge holders take the students or young people to a particular system and share with them the different plans and the knowledge associated with it. For example, in one village, the students were able to learn more than 100 wild edible plants, where, which previously uh, not known you know, to them. So uh, uh, like we all know that in India also, you know, we have a big program called Meet the Meal Program. So to further strengthen this initiative, uh, we have been uh, supporting the school in the inclusion of different local food uh, with the help of professional chef. So therefore, one of the unique uh, initiatives that we are doing here is inclusion of wild edible plants, you know, in this program, which has become, you know, like a really important, you know, for the community. And uh, besides that, you know, uh, uh, we have been doing a lot of uh, wash and then the nutritional campaign. Uh, this has really, you know, helped, especially during the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, which has really become a very, very important program for us. So uh, uh, we are doing a lot of uh, uh, work with young people so as you can see in the photograph here, so we have these young people, the students, the village community, uh, and then we have a chef, you know, a professional chef. So uh, the idea is that, you know, how to make local food, you know, like attractive. So therefore, you know, as you can see in the screen here, we have you know, like this local food, you know, being, you know, like the developed, you know, with the help of the professional chef then. So uh, some of the, uh, some of the initiatives that we are doing in the livelihood uh, for example, like uh, we have this uh, food processing and value addition with the communities. And then we have this Meiram O Cafe. Meiram O Cafe means Mother Earth Cafe. 
It's basically like a, uh, uh, like a restaurant in, in the village that promotes local food only. So we have this kind of cafe and then it has been well captured, you know, by uh, national and international media. And then this is the initiative that really caught, you know, the, the attention of the different entrepreneurs here, which uh, a lot of cafes, such cafes have coming out, you know, in place like Meghalaya where tourism becomes uh, quite prominent. And uh, we used to have this farmer's market, uh, monthly farmer's market which uh, we are, you know, like calling the farmers to come and sell you know, the produce in, in the urban so that, you know, there, there is a connection between the rural and urban, uh, you know, uh, people here. Then. So in Meghalaya also, we have this uh, uh, weeps, the Iris uh, thing, uh, products that we have here. So this is also the initiative that uh, uh, we have been able, you know, to revive. And then it has got, you know, like the market now. And then there is also one uh, embroidery which is like 2000 i mean 200 years ago that uh, that uh, kind of uh, uh, skill has been uh, dying out you know from this place so uh, our committees have been able you know to do that you know with with some of our support then and uh, in terms of uh, the innovation aspect then you know we have been doing a lot of work you know with the comty halls you know we want to use this hall as a place you know to showcase our niche to showcase you know the initiative done by the comty and then to exchange ideas among farmers and then uh, we also uh, have been able you know, to do a lot of work you know with the solar uh, uh, with the solar here because a number of villages here you know they are still not being accessed you know to electricity so i can uh, tell you that you know especially in the border area a lot of villages they don't have electricity so um, uh, in the place where where i come from uh, during winter the temperature sometimes it it, it jumps you know from from uh, six to um, uh, sometimes even to minus degree. So during winter, it has become very, very cold. So we introduced this Himalayan rocket stove to warm up you know, the, the places. It has also got a lot of positive response from the county. And uh, in terms of you know, the villages here, because uh, we, uh, this is the village uh, where I'm uh, currently you know, uh, living. It's a non village, as you, as you can see in the photograph. So we introduced this simple system called the vertical transportation, which does not need you know, like so much energy. It's basically you know, by using the, the, you know, the, the, the gravity. You know? So this idea has been you know, very well appreciated by the community, especially in these villages where you know, there's no uh, electricity. So these are some of the innovation and then a lot of challenges we are facing. And then uh, we, we kind of, you know, support the companies in whatever way we can. And uh, just to uh, uh, show you like some data here. So uh, when, when uh, we do, you know, this uh, dietary diversity score, so we have uh, developed an app called uh, Nutri app, which uh, we did, uh, you know, the DDS score, which is the uh, a food and agri uh, food and agri organization you know uh, the indicator that they have developed you know so uh, we find that you know when we did in 2018 and then as you can see on the screen 2021 there has been uh, you know little improvement you know in in the communities where you know where we uh, come from so for example here you know uh, the consumption of uh, green leafy vegetables as reported by more than 60 uh, percent of the respondent and then people now they are uh, more uh, into you know this uh, more, i mean getting more into this uh, uh, local food plants and then trying to understand you know what could be you know the the nutritional value in each species then and then we also found that you know through this work that we do in those villages where the the lowest the, the score is very less are those villages where you know the the dependency on market is very very high but you know uh, in those villages where the dds score is high which is more than 5 uh, we we uh, you know we came to the conclusion that you know those villages have the different food systems particularly you know for those people who are still practice you know shifting shifting collection and have uh, still uh, you know put forward and uh, in um, in uh, 2000, uh, in 2018, I mean 2021 also, we have been, uh, you know, doing this uh, uh, exercise, you know, we conducted, you know, this food insecurity studies in 18 uh, June villages in Meghalaya and Meghalaya under the FEO of, uh, under the F FEO guidance. So as we, as you can see on the screen, the level of food insecurity was, on, was found to be only 11.30% uh, uh, as against around 43.80, you know, for South Asia. So, you know, we can see that, you know, if we prom if we look into the food system, you know, we should look also into the different indigenous food system, you know, that the people are working, you know, to know better and then to address, you know, like the issue of hidden hunger. So uh, this is the, the festival that took place in 2015, where 169 uh, indigenous communities came and participated for this festival. So during the last day of the festival, we have more than 
twenty thousand people. So uh, therefore, you know, we are likely to host again a global festival in twenty twenty four to showcase, you know, that indigenous people food systems being nature positive is what the world needs to support as we are faced as we face uh, climate change. So uh, in my language, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we call Kubla Shibon. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is the end of my presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Piyush, uh, for that uh, very interesting uh, presentation. We'll have questions uh, later on. Now uh, we'll move on to Dr. Uh, Dr. Sugumar, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Tamil Nadu, uh, Dr. J. J. Lita Fishery University. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sugumar uh, has a more than 33 years of experience in teaching, research, and extension. And uh, his expertise is on uh, fishery microbiology. And he's a recipient of uh, Japanese government scholarship and carried out postdoctoral research uh, in uh, Hiroshima University. And uh, he's a life member of uh, Soft Eye and AMI, was a member of Japanese Society of uh, Fishery Science and Korean Society of Fishery Science, Aquatic Science, and WAS Asia Pacific Chapter. And I invite uh, Dr. Sumar to make this intervention. Over to you, Dr. Sumar. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oliver King, uh, uh, respected uh, chair of the session, Dr. Narayan Hedde. My previous speaker, Pius Rani from Nespas, and other speakers to come. Uh, let me share my slides and you would like to. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Uh, this is upset now. Yeah. Yeah, I will just put it in uh, slideshow mode. Make it full screen, please. Yeah, I'm just trying it. Are you able to see that now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm just going to uh, you know, suggest fisheries and aquaculture, how you would be able to meet the challenges in achieving the SDGs 1 and 2 in hilly and coastal regions. So, uh, already my previous speaker has said that uh, how important is the health and what is the status of our uh, health status of the population in India. Uh, when you just see, poverty has many dimensions, but its cause includes unemployment, social exclusion, and high vulnerability of certain populations to disasters, diseases, and other phenomena which prevent them from being productive. Even when they make genuine efforts, you know, the scope is limited for such underprivileged people, and what do we do about uh, them? See, when we are talking about no poverty, zero hunger, uh, health, it is very important that we address realistically and equitably uh, without taking care of one sector of the population. <clears throat> when you just see, India, although we have been developing rapidly in recent years, is still home to the largest undernourished population in the world. See, when we talk about this, already he has given some uh, facts about hunger and poverty in India. This is a recent FAO statistic survey, which says that undernourished, the population, 14.5% of our population is undernourished, and about 190.7 million, this is a spread to the 2020 uh, values, people, uh, about, uh, this much people go hungry every day. And 21 percentage of the people under five years of age are underage. So stunted children under five years of age, 38.4. I think it has improved from the figures that uh, our uh, previous speaker, Dr. Pius, has uh, shown. And malnourished children, about 25 percentage, and more importantly, 53 percentage, uh, you know, there is a prevalence of anemia among women of reproductive age. See, where do we stand as a country in hunger and poverty? See, if we are not addressing to this issue, especially the prevalence of anemia, the stunting from, uh, you know, uh, the, the reproductive age uh, women, if they are anemic, they cannot produce healthy children, and that is not a good news for uh, uh, our country. So we need to see how well we are able to overcome this. See, uh, and this poverty hunger is a real issue, although a certain sex do not feel, the sex of people do not feel about it. See, according to the World Food Program, 135 million suffer from acute hunger. 
largely due to man-made constraints, climate change and economic downturn. Down, down. But then this pandemic has added another 133 million people at risk of suffering acute hunger. This is a very real issue, and we have seen what happens to our migratory workers during, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic restrictions when there was no jobs, everything was closed down. So this has put us in a sort of uh, fix rather how to overcome. I don't want to go into the genesis and objectives of this speeches and all, but then their purpose is very, the underlying principle is really noble, and they are concerned about people, planet, prosperity, peace, and population. But for everything, basic is a decent food. And if there is a hunger and poverty, then we act, you know, chaos in the world, and there will not be any development. See, what is the way out? Increasing the productivity, agricultural productivity and other allied activities, productivity and sustainable food production are very crucial to help alleviate the perils of hunger. And more importantly, they should be equitable distribution. We know that we are producing grains, food grains and uh, food sustainably. We are more than self-sufficient, but then about 25% of the people are still not having decent food. It is mainly because of poor distribution and social security for this underprivileged. So some, you know, we have to overcome this with a little concerted effort. And I do not know whether we can differentiate this SDG 3 from 1 and 2. If, you know, it is just not the hunger, it is just not the poverty, but also a good health and well-being is required for any country to flourish, which involves, of course, so many other things. But then, uh, rather than good education, rather than good uh, the economy, and uh, uh, we need to have a proper food, proper shelter, which is the basic that we need to address. You know, gender equality are all real problems, but then, holistically, if you approach this problem, we will be coming out with something that, that can be, you know, this world can be a better place to live. Now, if you see one figure, there is a 31-year gap between the countries with the shortest and the longest life expectancy. This shows a disparity in this world, and we have to address to this. So it is a great principle and planning, and to overcome the perils of hunger and poverty, we need to really think about ways and means. I would rather suggest that fisheries and aquaculture can be very handy, because in world scenario, out of the 8 billion human population, 3.3 billion people's primary, people primary protein source comes from aquatic foods. We know aquatic foods are very rich foods, and it is not getting the due credits about this that just to have a slide to discuss about. See, poverty in India's coastal areas is avoidable. Many have predicted that poverty in our coastal areas is avoidable. But it's not happening. Why it is not happening? I have got a case study to uh, explain. Uh, the poverty of uh, fishers is reflected in their standard housing and sanitation systems and their meager access to basic communities such as clean drinking water and healthcare and inadequate transport services, as reported in a study made in Odisha. This, I see, it was not a recent study, but I just tell you, this is a study that has uh, come out uh, in 2014. Trends in poverty and livelihood in coastal fishing communities of Odisha, you know, they, they have analyzed the things very realistically with the indicators, and they have revealed that, you know, um, there are a lot of factors that affect their livelihood, but more importantly, the factor that affects them more is because they are more migratory in nature. Maybe seasonally they migrate, and this is one reason why you know it is a huge problem in Odisha, unlike in uh, you know places like in Tamil Nadu where it is uh, slightly better. <clears throat> okay, so fish. I say that fisheries aquaculture is a way to overcome this. How fish? You all know the real food or healthy food available for people of all strata along coast, ideal to combat hunger and malnourishment. See, there is absolutely no food as wholesome as that of uh, fish in terms of micronutrients, essential fatty acids, proteins, vitamins, minerals, and so on and so forth. If we have to see, you know, uh, the fish is really a super food, rich in proteins, many vitamins, uh, minerals and omega-3 fatty acids. See, multiple benefits from this uh, fatty uh, fish, especially rich in omega-3 uh, fatty acids and small fish containing nutrients in the skin and bones. See, these small fishes have got a lot of advantages about this. I'm going to talk one with one slide. 
fish consumption uh, by expectant mothers, eight children, neurodevelopment, which we say, and so it is very, very important in the early stages, especially from consumption to about two, three years of age for children. So this would uh, uh, help us develop very healthy uh, children. Uh, and uh, in coming to this omega-3 fatty acids, we know that it has got a lot of benefits, it is essential, and it reduces inflammation in the body, supports the immune system and healing, and um, we know that you know, small fishes, which are not very expensive, have uh, very high levels of omega-3 in anchovies, oysters, sardines, and so on and so forth. And coming to the protein, so it includes all of the essential amino acids that are required for that are required for human uh, health uh, and uh, support the immune system uh, and uh, uh, and it helps to build the body and provides all the nourishment. And as far as the vitamin A is concerned, it is one of the uh, very few animal sources that have got vitamin A, which regulates the immune system, protects against infections. And oily fishes like salmon, mackerel, cod, tuna are very good sources of this vitamin A. And coming to B vitamins, again, it regulates inflammation, promotes red and white blood cells. And when we talk about all these things, you know, further, I have to tell about one good point is that this, uh, you know, biologically available. Uh, minerals like uh, iron, iodine, zinc, selenium, potassium, calcium, all are present in the required quantities in fish, unlike in any other source. So this has to be promoted in a big way. But are we promoting fish in, or fish as a healthy food or a super food? I think we professionals have to give, in fact, it deserves more attention. It is not uh, fetching that much of attention as it deserves rather. I would rather say that small varieties of fish like sardines, which are affordable to the community, can very well be propagated as a you know, measure to combat hunger and malnourishment. And especially people in coastal uh, regions are having good access to that. And in fact, uh, you know, their health status is again debatable. I don't say that the health status is very bad. It is uh, really good. From our studies, we have found that, uh, you know, compared to other agricultural uh, rural areas, these coastal people are really healthy uh, in terms of uh, their growth, their build, their ability to take decisions. So both uh, mentally and physically, they are healthy. <clears throat> and uh, coming to uh, this is something very, very important and the most neglected area. Small indigenous fish species, which we call as SIF or SIF. See, these are very rich source of nutrients. See, this, the coastal regions, I say this, the coastal fisher community has got the access. But in the inland areas, inland water bodies, you know, these people are a little affected and this small indigenous fish species is going to be very handy in overcoming the malnourishment and the hunger. See, these SIs are very rich source of nutrients, sometimes sole source of animal protein to a significant population or population in regions near the natural water bodies. Yep. Uh, you know, and this has been very well seen in the Northeast as well as in Bengal. And they provide nutrition as company needs as a whole. That you know, the entire nutrition is being derived by the consumers. It is not that they take only the flesh. The fish is consumed the assets, and so it benefits the consumer. There is, but then there is no documentation on these, and the contribution of SI is not at all known very clearly. Only hardly one or two studies have just been published recently about how much quantum it is being uh, thought. Uh, that too, uh, arbitrary estimate as there is no proper documentation. We are we are deprived of proper documentation. And when there is a false document, when there is a false data, we are not going to make our strategies, our policy planning is not going to help us anyway. Because unless we have got a reliable and a, a correct, accurate data, we will not be able to do that. So that there needs to be further documentation, but this is doing a great uh, you know, help for uh, smaller communities around the water body. So we need to conserve these uh, uh, small indigenous fish species which are in the name of development, especially when you are propagating fish culture or aquaculture in tanks, they are weeding out these small fish there and trying to stock in seeds with IMC and other species. But we are losing the precious, nutritionally uh, significant, this SIS in a very big scale. And uh, you know, this not only affects the uh, food system, of the food, uh, but also the livelihood of the individual. Dr. Suhumar? Several people are based on these things. See, these are some of the photographs that are taken in the West Bengal and the Nazis, wherein there are so many different smaller varieties 
which uh, we can consume with Professor Sumar, we can you know they take it as an enterprise and also make a living, but also they consume. It is more important that they consume to preserve their health. So in that way, we have to promote promote this not only as a business enterprise but also as a means of protein and other nutrients for these people to stay healthy. Now that uh, you know, in order to you know increase the farmers' income and remove hunger and poverty, there is only one way. We have to integrate different enterprises so that the income is augmented. So several models are available. Several proven studies are there, which give that. You know, when you, uh, here I have just shown a uh, you know a table which shows that you know when you are having a crop alone, the cost benefit has been worked out. Uh, for a, a, a hectare of land, which would be one Professor? point seven. Sir, but sorry for the interruption. Uh, fish plus banana and agriculture are uh, integrated, and the cost benefit ratio was. Similarly, even if you integrate poultry, banana, fish, or any horticulture crop, or even the rice, you are going to get much better return, which is going to help farmers improve their income and also their food security. Professor Sumar? So, this is going to be the huge uh, pillar, and we have to promote. As fish uh, professionals, we have got time tested, we have got proven models, and ICR has come out with at least seven models, IFS models, which are uh, uh, suiting different agroclimatic conditions. So we have to propagate this as a means to combat that. And uh, here I have got a few slides, a few slides to show. Maybe, uh, uh, Professor Sumar, we can uh, wind up in next two minutes. Yeah, uh, I yeah. will try to wind up in uh, two thank minutes. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. This is uh, this is a documentation about a uh, fishing village called Kombuturai, where it is well managed. The fishermen are very well organized through societies. And when we made the study, we were able to make so we compared that village with a village about 20 kilometers away, where the fishing practices are slightly different because these people only go for line fish, others go for uh, you know multiple uh, gear fishing. Uh, but then the cost benefit ratio, if you work out, it is much much higher in this village than compared to other village. And these people follow a specific way of marketing, which augments their income. So it is mainly because of an organized society that is able to bring about this visible change. See, this here it is being auctioned per variety on kg basis and then it is sold on freight basis. It is not adapted in any other place. They are all sold just like that as a heap and we don't segregate even sometimes they segregate and then you take out. But it is not evaluated properly, it is not uh, you know, auctioned per kg basis and so they don't get uh, anything. And the income also is very, very sustaining. In fact, you know, the next slide shows that how uh, the health, uh, the consumption pattern of these fishes in this village is known. They actually spend about 42% in food, clothing, cheap means actually they do savings. 4% of their income is an organized savings. And for their children's education, they spend about 9%. And for social obligation, again, this is this is again a sort of saving for them. For any festival and all, they actually make an organized savings. And for transport, medical, recreation, loan repayment, and the mobile recharging, welfare, and uh, uh, village education. Here again, the village is able to give them back. So, if you see about 7-8% about is their saving and none of the villagers, none of the fishers in that area is weak or unhealthy and there is no poverty, absolutely there is no poverty and it is mainly because they are very well regulated. We documented this and not only documented, we wanted to increase sort of home management for a sustained uh, benefit. So, what we did is we actually talk, talk about this concept with the World Bank team and we formalized the project and then we formed the co-management committee with State Department official, uh, Fitness College uh, faculty and the, the staff, I uh, mean the, the village uh, society leaders and some of the um, uh, so, uh, social activists and then we had a regular monthly meeting to see how well they will be able to do and based upon their need we also organized several training and also many civic initiatives they did and now this could be something like a model village where they are well aware of the price rent, the market, they are, the value of their uh, catch so they get better returns and their village is very healthy so this is a very well managed fishing village and so all the coastal villages this can be emulated or taken as a model for adoption and one more study, see in nowadays the sustainability of the coastal resources is very much affected by 
the uh, vagaries of climate change. So we made a sort of socio-economic vulnerability of social household in the, uh, the, the, the district, in the Tutukudi district. All the fishing villages uh, we took, and this is based upon a framework for social vulnerability assessment, and this is based on you know, several factors we had taken, mainly the socio-economic vulnerability assessment we made, and we also we, uh, thought of that, that we made actually to uh, a matrix with which the sensitivity and adaptive capacity of the villages were uh, evaluated, and based upon that, they were classified as safe or uh, you know uh, risky or more vulnerable and risk vulnerable. And also we assessed they, uh, how to how to improve their adaptive capacity and reduce their vulnerability. So this is the study that we have made with about 52 indicators. The socio-economic vulnerability indicators we took about 52. We vetted with uh, some experts. And then based on the alternate livelihood uh, activity index and based upon the community resource uh, dependent index, we were able to classify those villages. And the villages, uh, the index scales were rated according to uh, the uh, perception. And then a decision matrix was also arrived at. And we found that about uh, 63 villages are still vulnerable. I mean, 63 percentage, that is 15 out of the 24 villages in Tudukudi districts are still vulnerable and having a, a way they are in the high vulnerable stage for which we need to do. And we also had identified which are the drivers of vulnerability and also we have identified certain buffers which would help overcome all these things. So based on that, we, we really had the found that those villages which have more than one livelihood options are very safe and their awareness is good, and their income, income is good, and the socioeconomic status is good, and they are healthy. So still, they are, there are about uh, you know 35 percentage of our uh, fishing villages in Tuticorin district are highly vulnerable, and for them, they now you know to increase their adaptation or adaptive capacity to the vagaries of the climate change and uncertainty, we have to equip them. And this cannot be one size fits all. Like it has to be based upon village needs. Every village has to be assessed for the needs. And accordingly, we have to strategize to, uh, you know, improve these things. So these two, uh, you know, uh, case studies, one says that the villages are really good if they are well managed, they are going to reap a lot of benefit and they are healthy. On the other hand, you, you know, the vulnerability <coughs> index that we studied, you know, most of the villages are still vulnerable. If there is any change in the uh, climate and uh, because of that, the resource gets affected, we are going to be highly suffering. And so, we, unless otherwise the policy interventions are there to equip themselves with a little more alternate livelihoods, rather than dependent too much dependence on fishing alone, we will not be able to help these people. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to share my thoughts. With all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Sukumar, uh, for that uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, though it took a little longer, uh, right. you have highlighted the importance of. Uh, Know, fish uh, as a superfood, and also you talked about co-management practices that is needed for uh, uh, in the fishery sector, and also you have touched upon the vulnerability analysis aspects of it. Uh, certainly, we will have uh, more questions during the discussion. Now we will uh, move on to uh, Professor uh, Sunil Notial. Uh, Dr. Sunil is the director of uh, GP Pant National Institute of Himalayan Environment. Uh, Almora in India, and uh, his specialization includes uh, area of uh, NRM, natural resource management, conservation, and uh, basically, you know, socio-economic and ecological approaches uh, for sustainable development is a key expert area, and he has done a lot of work related to ecological modeling as well. And uh, over to Dr. Uh, Sunil for your insights, and uh, maybe uh, you can take about 10 minutes uh, for your intervention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this very in interesting and contemporary uh, international conference on sustainable development uh, in hill and uh, coastal ecoregions. Uh, I thank the organizer, organizers for uh, uh, giving me a slot in this, again, interesting session of this entire conference. That is session six, where we'll be talking about, uh, we are talking about goal number one and two, no poverty and zero hunger. And this is very heartening to know that uh, these are the issues which, which uh, Professor M. S. Swaminathan uh, has been uh, highlighting for ma many, many years. And he is the person who has India, who has made India a poor secure nation in, in, in this 
the contemporary world. Yesterday we have celebrated his birthday and uh, we could not be there in person, per, uh, person but I would like to extend my uh, warm uh, wishes and uh, uh, happy belated uh, birthday wishes to Professor M. S. Paminathan. Uh, Professor Narayan Hegade and my co-speakers, uh, um, uh, I would like to highlight some of the very crucial and critical issues as far as Indian Himalayan is concerned. I work in Indian Himalayan region and uh, our institute, uh, Institute uh, B.P. Pant National Institute of Himalayan Environment, uh, its mandate is to, to undertake, you know, to undertake very in-depth, very in-depth research and development studies on, on environmental problems in, in the Himalayan region to identify and strengthen the local knowledge. Basically, we are documenting the traditional ecological knowledge and are trying to understand the scientific rationale behind traditional ecological knowledge, which has contributed immensely in sustaining the society and ecology of this fragile but equally important ecosystems of the world and the country. And we are also, I think theme is very interesting and previous speaker, Dr. Sukumar has given a lot many insights on very innovative ideas which could be helpful for, for mitigating the threats related to poverty and hunger. Here in this institute, our main, one of the main objective is to evolve and demonstrate the suitable technological packages for, for, for societal development. On the other hand, for environmental conservation. I'm sorry I could not prepare my slide because I was on extensive travel, but I will speak some of the issues which are very pertinent in the Himalaya and how this institute, how our institute has contributed towards overcoming um, on, of, of some of the very critical uh, challenges uh, uh, in, in providing the support system to the society and other stakeholders who are upfront in uh, the areas of environmental conservation. Himalayas, as we know, a very, very vast mountain system in the world. And in our country, if you see, this is only this area, this landscape is covering 15, roughly 15 lakh square kilometer, 17% area of our country. And this area holds, or, 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 holds roughly 40, 48 or 49 million people. So in that perspective, it's only 4% population of our country resides in Himalaya. But the problems are enormous. Enormous in the sense is that society in Himalaya, if you talk about Himalaya, it spans over 11 states of our country plus two union territories, Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. And here we have the societies, many are Aboriginal, for example, 170 ethnic groups and many scheduled tribes, which are still dependent on nature and natural resources to sustain their livelihood, to sustain their, their economy, to sustain uh, their day-to-day -day activities. But unfortunately, challenges are enormous and these challenges on these issues requires very immediate attention. I would like to go to highlight them one by one and then problem solving ideas. Okay. So the first is that if we say that Himalaya society, Himalayan society is still dependent on agriculture to sustain their basic needs, to sustain their life, lifestyle, to sustain their livelihood. But unfortunately, the problems are in contemporary world are enormous. One is, one is definitely the change in climatic conditions, climate change, acculturation, change in food habits, so on and so forth. But one of the very pertinent problems which society is facing nowadays, the lo crop loss, the, the, the uh, uh, crop damage due to wildlife. In our state, Uttarakhand, I had uh, worked immensely to understand the extent of the crop loss that is caused due to wildlife. And I have reported it's more than 60 to 70%. And see, this is about the crops. But if you go to the horticultural loss, the loss is much more higher than this. So this issue needs to be, if we are talking about zero hunger and no poverty, so first this issue has to be tackled by all the stakeholders on a high priority basis. Second point is that extreme weather events. 
unprecedented events are happening and we don't have himalaya as you know uh, professor hegde is well versed uh, academician of our country himalaya is data deficit region we don't have enough data enough historical data in a very consolidated form which could give us some kind of insights that what to be done seeing in the past no data is quite segregated and unprecedented events are happening even events would have happened some time five decades ago in same place but we don't have actually historical data of that so we say that unprecedented the event could have happened in the past but data is not there and how to tackle this this causes loss of damage to society and ecology of the area out migration is one of the major problem so say our mountain regions mountain strategically himalaya is very very important people are leaving the mountain in job and other you know uh, to to find better opportunity to to, to become uh, uh, more urban while they see the people in urban area that urbanize influence them a lot but unfortunately one thing i would like to highlight here is that my study indicates that people are not leaving himalaya because of environmental problems on top of topography they are leaving himalaya because of because of lack of facilities which requires for 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 them for example to get proper medical services medical health services better education to their children and these two three issues are very very pertinent which cause people to migrate from the hill region another point i would like to 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 mention is that that uh, traditional food habits land use and other transformation is taking place and depletion of genetic resources this is a huge challenge lots of varieties are introduced to the himalaya which are not native and creating lots of problems in the area and this balance the services the service requirement from the ecosystems and giving back to ecosystem so there is a mismatch in that these are the some of the issues which need which need immediate as attention as time is given only for 10 minutes i have highlighted only a, some of the some of the pertinent problem but i would like to say what institute what we have done in this endeavor how we are handling these problems one i one problem one solution what we say is that we institute our institute has done enormous work as far as socio ecological restoration is concerned institute has initiated this was this united nations has declared this decade as ecological or decade for ecological restoration but our institute has started this work in early 80s early, uh, late late 80s uh, sorry late 80s and developed several models for ecological restorations to ensure first of all to ensure the 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 uh, the to ensure the food security of the region or to is to to ensure the resource availability in this resource rich area resource rich and resource for both i must tell resource rich and resource poor if i get a portion to to discuss during discussion i will definitely highlight this point another point is that we we have we have brought because we also found that mountain farming is not able to support or to not not able to support the day to day demand of the people in days to come and therefore we have developed a unique model for domestication of the wild medicinal plants into the mainland and we say low volume high value crops to enhance the economic condition of farmers and for that what we did is that we have developed proper buyback policies for farmers so that they are encouraged to cultivate low volume and high value crops uh, in the region to enhance their economic status so based from this this kind of model we have this this kind of model we have developed many agroecological regions of our country and then farmers are able to obtain 20 to 25 times more profit than they are having from uh, traditional uh, farming systems another is that rejuvenating uh, re rejuvenating uh, the ecosystems through proper harnessing the resources which are not so useful so pine needle is one among them where we have the lots of uh, uh, local uh, you know value added products from the pine needles to to reduce the fire frequency in the ecosystems and to enhance the local economy what we are doing is that our our aim is to vocal for local and focus to become global so skill development and capacity building is one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, aspects of our research in this institute and in this endeavor institute has done and demonstrated a uh, lot many uh, models across the himalayan region and we believe i and you we are innovating and we are up, up, up scaling the model 
for, uh, for towards ensuring the sustainability to social and ecological systems of Indian Himalayan region. So I exactly took 10 minutes more time I'll spend in discussion. Thank you so very much. Th thank you, Dr. Uh, Sunil, uh, for that uh, presentation. And uh, you have highlighted uh, many issues pertaining to Himalayan region, especially the impact of crop loss and, uh, and uh, unprecedented disaster happening there. And also you highlighted the need of uh, data availability to assess the situation. And also you highlighted the pragmatic needs of the community, why they are migrating. So these things probably during the discussion, I know the audience here, they will be uh, questioning and we will respond to that. We will now move on to uh, Dr. Gopinath. Uh, Dr. Gopinath is a principal scientist at MS Swaminathan Foundation. He's a development ec economist by training, having over five, 15 years of experience working with uh, different regions in the country. And uh, he's interested in working on um, the food security and agrarian transformation. And he's also serving as a member of uh, Tamil Nadu State Committee to draft uh, policy on women. And uh, he, he has been involved in both uh, the policy space as well as in the inter intervention space. I invite uh, Dr. Gobinath to make this presentation. Uh, thanks, Dr. Radhiva, uh, for a nice introduction. Uh, uh, we, uh, on behalf of our team, we thank uh, organizers to give a slot to share some of our findings from an ongoing study to understand uh, outcome, I mean, uh, outcomes from our MSSR of interventions in hill and coastal regions. It's an ongoing study. Uh, uh, one team is involved in uh, studying these uh, interventions. And uh, some of the findings I used to share with this flow and whatever suggestion comes, uh, we are happy to take it and uh, address during our study. Can you, should I? So the interventions, uh, of course, directly uh, address SDG 1 and 2 and indirectly address uh, SDG 5, 13, and many other SDGs. Uh, the, the, the three cases uh, where I would like to share is uh, from uh, Kohli Hills, that is uh, millet-based interventions, uh, Kohli Hills in Tamil Nadu, and uh, farming system for nutrition uh, intervention in Jaipur of uh, Odisha state. And uh, the, the fisheries value addition work, which is going on in Pumbukhari area of uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, Dr. Velvili had uh, explained in detail about the type of works going on in uh, Pumbukhari area and also uh, need to uh, address some of the gray areas uh, existing in the co coastal community. And that gives a clear context. And that will be a third case. And I would like to start with the millet case from Kohli Hills. And we are all very well know that uh, how this uh, millet production, uh, area under millet and millet production going on for the last 30, 40 years, there are many reasons. And the MSSRF uh, uh, previous works clearly documented reasons for declining uh, area under uh, millets and uh, production in different areas, particularly in Kohli Hills. And uh, we observed that uh, the area under millets in Kohli Hills, it was 1,799 hectares in 1970-71. And then it declined to 645 hectares in 1999-2000 when we started a rigorous intervention in that particular collegial sea areas. And you can see uh, for all these uh, factors and factors responsible for this decline and uh, how these millets are closely associated with that uh, cultural practices and how these external forces uh, influence uh, uh, consumption, production and consumption of millets in collegials in all of our publications, particularly if you go through the books that we released in the, uh, on yesterday, you can see all those cases. But what we uh, adopted, what, uh, or what, we, what approach we adopted in that uh, collegials area is something like uh, a holistic value chain approach. It's from end to end. It's not one particular area, it's a end to end for entire thing from uh, type of seed variety selection and conserving that seeds into uh, the providing uh, 
uh, forward and backward linkages to come up uh, to, to to provide a better market opportunities to the particular community to simplify our uh, uh, this thing I would like to explain very few points here these are all summary of our uh, uh, studies detailed uh, analysis is available with us that is going on whoever interested we can share with you one is something like we started to create community based seed banks it's uh, those seed banks are managed by community and these community uh, seed banks we used to, to start so far started 15 community uh, seed banks in collegial areas and we, we facilitated community and we also involved in that participatory varietal selection seed selection of uh, different uh, millets and all those may have, uh, we, we, we encouraged them and we were supported them to conserve all those uh, identified millets in that community seed banks as, uh, as well and the second one is on farm operations so on farm operations we were observed that, uh, that the operations went on in that area that were not uh, up to that mark and we introduced some on farm interventions uh, something like uh, uh, row maker spad for weeding in millets uh, intercrop with the tapioca tapioca is a is a major crop in that particular area uh, a star weeder kind of thing and all other uh, something like uh, hoe sickle using all those things in a better way to improve productivity of millets in a particular unit of area. So these are all interventions that MSSR have introduced during the last two decades in that uh, area to enhance productivity and also, uh, I mean, uh, train the community to go for better agronomic practices. And then, then after, after these operations, and we also help the community to process I mean, uh, for this uh, post-harvest uh, operations. So we introduced we introduce that uh, uh, processing units in that area. Again, those processing units started in 18, uh, 18 such kinds in that area that covers 81 uh, settlements in Kolli Hills. And we, we, that processing units facilitated that community to process at the local level in a way to enhance availability in the local market itself. That will result increasing uh, uh, millet consumption uh, at household level. So those kind of processing units we started and when we, uh, chairperson ourselves, when we visited that, uh, uh, that colleagues villages, we observed that after MSSRF introduced certain machineries for drudgery reduction other things, uh, it was other agencies who also came to that and introduced such uh, machineries and we are happy to claim that MSSRF only started all those kind of uh, missionaries in introduction of such missionaries in uh, collegial area and uh, in a way we capacitate that uh, uh, capacitate that local community on value addition uh, better marketing linkages with other areas and uh, and finally we we, we 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 federate that farmers into one group in a way to enter into a market with a better capacity uh, to uh, market that producers so these are all some of the key interventions and that interventions uh, resulted something like increasing uh, yield from a minimum of 17 to 50 percent. That increase in yield comes from different uh, reasons. One is uh, application of better seed varieties, improved agronomic practices, and application of improved farm implements. So all those things, uh, three, uh, these things uh, provided better yield per unit of land in uh, Kolli Hills. Other one is this, uh, this community seed banks uh, that ensures availability of germplasm uh, uh, during all periods. So whenever farmer requires a particular uh, seed variety, that is available in the community seed bank. So it addresses seed availability at the local level, even at the village level. So that, that, that role uh, played by community seed banks, that's a major reason for uh, conserving that millets and also increasing area under millets in after 2014-15 in Kolli Hills. Uh, this milling units that saved up to 90 percentage of uh, uh, women's time spent on processing uh, millets uh, for consumption. And we interviewed with some old uh, women and they clearly narrated that story, how these uh, processed units reduced that time in uh, processing those millets, I think. 
And this increase in availability, uh, this point I have already explained, that increase in availability and making better access to these uh, millets that resulted uh, better uh, biodiversity at the household level. And we have tested such, uh, such things in other areas, like Koraput, Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka, and Uttarakhand. And uh, we, we, we got a positive response in all these uh, states. And the second case is Jaipur. And I need not tell. Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay. <laughs> uh, the second case one is from uh, Koraput. I need not tell uh, why the, uh, we need to address nutritional uh, deficiency at the village level because our uh, previous speakers have already explained all those things. The point is in an area where you have a severe nutritional deficiencies and more than three fourths of our rural households are depending on agriculture. Uh, any way to address these deficiencies through food-based approach or through agriculture that has a greater scope. That's why Professor Swami, Professor Emma Swami Nathan has introduced the concept called farming system for nutrition. And we adopted that farming system for nutrition. That is nothing but a mainstreaming uh, nutritional criteria whenever you go for crop selection uh, or uh, livestock or wherever feasible uh, fisheries in that areas. And we adopted that farming system for nutrition in. Uh, in, uh, in Jaipur areas, and we started this one from 2011 onwards. And that, we, 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 it, it was again like a systematic manner. First, our team uh, studied the socioeconomic characteristics, ag existing agriculture status, nutritional status, food consumption, and dietary diversity existing in the particular area. And then we designed our interventions, something like uh, uh, how to introduce uh, nutrition, uh, nutrient-dense crops, and how to improve productivity of certain nutrition-dense crops which were cultivated in an unscientific manner. So all our interventions are scientific interventions, and all these agronomic practices were uh, farmer-friendly practices which can be adapted without any additional cost. And our, our team facilitated that farmers to get all those uh, uh, necessary knowledge and equipments uh, with, uh, with the government and also with the local markets. And it resulted something like we also helped them to use the fallow lands, that uh, paddy fallow kind of lands uh, under uh, pulses are better way to get uh, more, uh, more yield from the existing uh, pulses crops. Okay. And the, the third uh, very important thing is uh, nutrition garden. Uh, if you see our MSSR of document, Professor Swaminathan started this talking about this nutri garden from late 90s onwards. So we, 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 our intervention in that area, it was like we just converted that kitchen garden into nutri garden by having all four group of uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. Because that area, uh, most of the household depend on their own uh, production for their consumption. So in that case, if you introduce any such intervention at household level by converting that kitchen garden in, in, into nutri nutrition garden, we would have immediately get impact on their uh, food plate. And it was happened in uh, uh, Koraput also. Sorry, I don't have time. I'm just uh, uh, <laughs> uh, rushing up. Okay, We observed that the household diet diversity score improved that is mainly due to increasing uh, fruits and vegetables availability at the household level and also variety of fruits and uh, vegetables availability on the local markets. All those, uh, all those fruits and vegetables available in the local markets were marketed from the households in that local particular area. And the other important dimension, important thing is orange flesh sweet potato. It's something like a beta carotene rich orange flesh sweet potato which we promoted and because instead of going for a regular uh, uh, sweet potato, farmers used to go for this orange flesh sweet potato, and they started consuming this one. And uh, this the, 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 the daily consumption of uh, vegetables, uh, the, uh, daily consumption. This is about the frequency of consumption. It is observed that a variety of fruits and vegetables used to consume by uh, farmers on a daily basis, and this proportion got increased uh, from baseline to end line. And uh, this, uh, plus it also improved uh, productivity on crucial crops like um, millets in that particular area. And the, 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 the third case is uh, value addition <laughs> in fisheries. And as I said that, uh, uh, we already uh, set the tone. Yeah. 
uh, too many kids are involved. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> and what we introduced is something like entrepreneurial uh, kind of activities, where we trained, we capacitated that uh, women in that particular area. And instead of going for regular, uh, uh, I mean, uh, head loading that fishes and selling in the market, women were got trained through our uh, centers, and they, they, they now they are involving in value addition of all those fishery, fishes, whatever they. Uh, they buy from that market, and their operations are more hygienic now. And it resulted something like uh, the reduction of post harvest losses uh, from a minimum of 15 to 10 to 15 percent. This is a minimum one, and the actual one might have been higher. We are doing that process, the calculation process, and the empowerment of uh, uh, these trainings and capacity buildings uh, resulted uh, in their. Uh, uh, increasing purchasing power, which will, uh, which uh, has a clear impact on the type of food they are having, and also health. Uh, I mean, healthcare facilities available. I mean, their access to healthcare facilities in the nearby area because they have a better healthcare, and their participation in value addition and post harvesting processing got increased in the way that uh, women something like uh, participating that uh, fishing activities. I mean, fish selling uh, like. Uh, uh, unskilled kind of thing. Now they are getting more empowered. They are doing more skilled kind of activities. So it's something like uh, uh, our interventions convert that community into a better skilled one and also better sustained uh, uh, way. And they are having better purchasing power now. And I would like to insist this point. All our interventions are more scientific one and more adaptable to that particular area. and. Uh, uh, the, the final one is our influence on this policy is uh, is happening at a state level. What Odisha team influences uh, state uh, state government to introduce the term called the nutrition sensitive agriculture in their agriculture policy, and the national level where uh, the, uh, they take uh, strong cases from Kolli Hills to emphasize including millets in that uh, uh, National Food Security Act, and also international uh, this uh, fisheries. Well, uh, whenever the uh, fisheries department is doing some work, they immediately contacted our centers to get inputs to include in the document. And also international level, uh, we are influencing different societies through our interventions. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Gobinath, uh, for that uh, interesting presentation. I'm sure uh, we'll have a lot of questions around uh, you know, how our intervention had uh, actually reached out to the farming and fishing community in the hill as well as coastal region. Uh, certainly, we'll come back to that a little later. So now we have uh, Dr. Sara, who is online now. He, Dr. Sara is the president and CEO of uh, Eco Agriculture Partners. And uh, she's an agricultural and natural resource economist. And uh, she had uh, co-founded and chaired the 1,000 Landscapes for 1 Billion. People Initiative, it's an interesting organization uh, with that works globally to support local-led uh, landscape partnership. And uh, she also served as a director of uh, ecosystem services for Forest Trends, that is, an, uh, that is an NGO that promotes forest conservation through improved markets for forest products and ecosystem services. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sara is a member of uh, United Nation Millennium, Millennium Project Task Force on Hunger, as well as the member of Board of Directors of the World Agroforestry Center in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, she, had, she has been serving as an expert advisory group on uh, food security of the United Nation Environment Program. Over to you, Dr. Sarah, for your intervention. Thank you so much. It's it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you here. I so admire the work of the MS Swami Nathan Foundation, and Dr. Swami Nathan is is really my hero in the food and agriculture um, world for for many decades. Uh, it's a pleasure also to see you, Dr. Dr. Hegde, and other other colleagues there. Um, I want to talk with you today a little bit about building on all of the other presentations in the panel today to look at all the dimensions that really lead to achieving sustainable development goals, uh, particularly in complex ecosystems like hilly areas and coastal ecosystems. So if you move to the next slide, I uh, just want to um, get there. Uh, when we're talking about meeting the SDGs, it can't be 
be done piece by piece. We need to look at dimensions of human well-being like nutrition and income, look at transforming regenerative economies and food systems to support these multiple outcomes from our landscapes and have healthy nature, biodiversity, water systems, uh, a stable climate, and an inspiration for social groups to work together. If you'll go to the, to, to the next slide. Um, unfortunately, most of the work for the last century uh, in policy and even in research until innovators like the Swaminathan Foundation became involved were very sectorally siloed. Uh, with environmental issues in one place, uh, forestry in another, agriculture in another. And we did not have institutions to support the kind of integrated strategies for landscape management that are clearly demanded uh, in hilly and coastal ecosystems, but I would argue even in our bread baskets and rice bowls of the world as well. If you'll move to the next slide. What we've been working with for the last couple of decades is a new institutional model, uh, which we call as an umbrella term, integrated landscape management. And this is where you have very systematic long-term collaboration among land managers and different stakeholders that have their interest in agriculture, fisheries, nutrition, uh, health, and education to generate the full range of goods and services that is needed from their landscape uh, to meet their own long-term goals. Um, what's very exciting is that over the last couple of decades, we have seen a global movement of local landscape partnerships, most of them coming from the grassroots, but increasingly now we're starting to get support from uh, NGOs, from research institutions, from governments to enable these platforms and, and partnerships between landscapes. This is actually um, evidence from four continental reviews um, that documented, you know, more, almost 450 um, large-scale uh, agricultural landscape initiatives. Many of these were in coastal and, 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 and hilly areas. If you'll go to the next slide, um, the, the, there's a lot of different words and names for this. We have integrated watershed management, we have territorial development, jurisdictional landscapes, agroecological landscapes, biological corridors, et cetera. But they all have, they're, they're different, they're unique. They have different entry points to engage people, but they have five common features. And I'll move through these quickly. Um, the, go to the next slide. The first key feature is collaborative, community-engaged processes for dialogue and negotiation and planning and action around the landscape as a whole. The second component they have in the next slide is that they negotiate around shared or agreed long-term landscape objectives that encompass the many benefits from landscapes. They define these, they make them visible, they agree to move in these direction in a, an aligned way. The third one, is that the design of the individual field, farm, forest, and business practices benefit multiple landscape objectives. And all the examples that were presented here today have shown uh, how these really clever ways of designing interventions that have multiple benefits and impacts on people, the, the economy, and, and nature. The fourth uh, key element they have in common is an intentional effort to manage land uses across the landscape so it produces synergy. So you get watershed level restoration from your water and farming and other interventions. You get biodiversity interventions by coordinating the work in the forests with the work in the farm fields, et cetera. And you try to address con conflicts among them in a very explicit way. And finally, the fifth key feature of all of these different approaches is the design of markets, policies, and financing that are aligned with that integrated landscape strategy. And this is in some, sometimes even the hardest piece, but we've seen some great examples of this today. If you'll go to the next slide, if those are the outcomes that we, that those are the kinds of things we want to see happen in landscapes, you need a much more structured process within the landscape to make that happen. And you need facilitators from multiple organizations and agencies, from farmers, from local governments, from environmental NGOs, businesses, banks, other groups. They, there's, there's basically five elements of this process. And it's not a linear process. It's probably a cyclical process. But you need efforts to strengthen that landscape partnership to a long-lasting coalitions working across the sectors. 
need to develop a shared understanding so the farmers understand really the, the what matters for biodiversity and what matters for climate and the climate actors understand what's needed for food security. You need visioning, collaborative visioning and planning and spatially targeted action plans. Fourth, you need to take action by coordinate actions of the groups and particularly mobilize the kind of public, private and civic financing that's needed to support the different coordinated investments within the landscape and track implementation. And finally, you need learning and impact. If you'll go to the next slide, just to, just to give you some very preliminary illustrative uh, uh, evidence of the benefits of this kind of integrated approach. This is from that survey that was in the pre previous map of 166 integrated landscape initiatives in 16 countries in South and Southeast Asia. And if you'll just look at the sustain impacts on the sustainable development goals one and two, you can see that it's have impacts on nine of the 17 goals. 46% um, of these experienced significant increases in agricultural yields and in profitability for farms, reduced environmental impacts, improved 69% improve food security by working together across the sectors with all integrated approaches. So if you move to the next slide, how can we expand and replicate this experience? Because this is not an easy thing to do. How can we strengthen the capacity of landscape partnerships to do this kind of integrated work? And in response to that challenge, in 2019, a group of partners came together who work internationally um, to set a very ambitious goal, to say that by 2030, by the time we want to deliver the sustainable development goals, that landscape partnerships across the world are delivering sustainable landscape solutions across a thousand landscapes in which a billion people live, contributing to the SDGs and aligning actions across these different dimensions. You go to the next slide. So I'm going to tell you, spend just a few minutes to tell you the highlights of what we're trying to do with 1,000 landscapes for 1 billion people. Um, the first one is around mainstreaming landscape thinking and skills through our landscape capacity strengthening. We're developing learning modules across all of those five aspects of the integrated landscape management action framework and specific outputs from them so that they can be accessed remotely to work very closely with developing train the trainer approaches with landscape networks and learning and training institutions. And finally, the people can use to provide direct support. The next, the second component is we call Terrasso. It's a digital software platform, which starts with mobile phones that people can use and all have access to. And it's providing comprehensive, open source, easy to use software and tools. And the whole system's being structured around the action plan a framework with adaptable tools aiming to help local landscape partnerships work better, faster, and be more inclusive. We're currently co-designing this with about 12 landscape partnerships globally. If you'll keep going, the third main area we're working on is finance. Right now, even when landscape partnerships develop a phenomenal landscape action plan, the kinds of interventions we've heard about today in the panel, they can't get funding to invest in them. So we're trying to do three things, assist landscape partners to be much better at developing and structuring finance for their landscape action plan. Secondly, accelerating the development of fit for purpose finance mechanisms and promoting the transformation of financial institutions to shift their funds instead of project by project, sector by sector investments, looking at those holistic integrated investment strategies. And the fourth key area of action is in catalyzing communities. Um, and they we're initiating and supporting place-based and practice-based communities, place-based like in Kenya, working to try to in integrate support for uh, landscape partnerships into this, the counting state uh, development plans uh, and practice-based communities like a uh, community on, on landscape, community of practice on landscape finance. And we also have digital networking via Terrasso. And the final key component of a thousand landscapes is what we call the global hub our efforts to uh, harmonize our efforts. You see the logos below of the seven very diverse organizations that are that are stewarding uh, this initiative. Eco Agriculture Partners, my organization is the convener. Uh, we work together with the managing the global hub with Rainforest Alliance. 
Um, we also have a finance group that works with us, Landscape Finance Lab, the United Nations Development Program, which is the world's largest financier of integrated landscape management, Conservation International, which looks at the conservation perspective, Common Land, which looks at the landscape development, and Tech Matters, which is a Silicon Valley-based tech uh, group, uh, not, not for profit, that's uh, supporting our Terrasso uh, area. And, and we now have, in addition to the seven partners, we have 28 what we call technical partners who are working to support landscape partnerships in different places. Um, we hope the Swaminathan Foundation may soon become one of those. Um, and we're working now with 20, initial 20 landscape partnerships to co-design and test the interventions. We're we're developing, uh, we'll be expanding by 2023 to 50 landscapes and then to 300 and then to 1,000. By. We'll start our scaling strategy in 2024. So this just gives you some links you could go to if you want to find out a little bit more about uh, eco-agriculture and 1,000 landscapes or contact me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarah, for that uh, excellent uh, presentation and insight, sharing uh, your views on uh, how important of this integrated landscape approach uh, to address the uh, sustainable goal objective one and two. Uh, now, uh, you know, yeah, we will, uh, um, we are expecting more questions uh, from the audience here, and uh, we had uh, five interesting uh, uh, presentations and uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Amit, yeah, and you can uh, shoot to the targeted uh, presenter, uh, uh, make it short and uh, yeah. Well, it's a very interesting session, and I have more observations than uh, questions. In fact, it was triggered off by Dr. Hegre. To me, the biggest question, and if I take MSSRF and uh, Pius's work in Meghalaya. And the first question that comes to my mind is, can SDG goals one and two be achieved without looking at that goal of, uh, I think that's uh, goal 10? Yeah, life on form. Inequality. Yeah, yeah inequality. 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 Yeah. And goal 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. I somehow, you know, the role of institutions falls through tables and lies on the floor and gets stacked. I think I've had the privilege of being to almost most of the MSSRF sites and include some of the old bias sites. It began with institution building. It doesn't figure in the discussion. Why? Mm -hmm. Second, if you look at the histories of institutions, what happens is when the interventionist leaves, the institution either remains strong and proceeds ahead or sometimes it collapses. Yet there's no study on why an institution failed. Finally comes in this whole thing of, you know, well, the role of decent work and building partnerships in the tribal belt, including in Meghalaya. Whenever, whenever an institution, I mean, okay, an NGO is supposed to show and model and leave grows, goes stronger, and tries to co take control of its own present, its future, which depends on the natural resources, the government forces, no point naming the department and the states, either call them Naxalites, or left-wing extremists, or AFSA, let's put on them. You have, if you look at the National Wasteland Atlas from year to year, year to year, under the name of making wastelands productive, they are converted now into industrial plantations. Nutrition falls, the institution collapses, and the worst hit are the people who stay behind. They cannot migrate, the old women, the children. So naturally, the nutrition rises. So where do we have that holistic vision and debate? And MSS Alpha is a very good example of this. Jharkhand, all those institutions that were formed in the 70s and 80s now have been declared Naxalite. Why? Because they asked for, I mean, they wanted to be the controllers of their own destiny. So why don't we bring that also into the debate? Thank you. 
Thanks, Dr. Amit, for that uh, comment. Dr. TJ? Uh, I think my question is uh, addressed to Dr. Sara, but I think uh, uh, some of the dimensions of that uh, uh, Amit has already uh, touched upon. You see, you know, this, uh, this idea that we have uh, uh, integrated landscape management, uh, now that uh, certainly seems uh, very appealing but I would ask the same question that uh, Amit was asking. What about inequality? You know, landscapes are not all commons. If you talk about uh, forests, etc., there's a complex set of issues there. So let me leave forests aside. Uh, certainly with regard to uh, the valley, you know, there would be farmland, and farmland is a matter of private property. So, in under what circumstances does this landscape management work? So, who owns the land? I mean, uh, farmers uh, uh, of varying socio-economic scales are working for uh, what we politely call livelihoods. In some cases, it is survival. In other cases, it is accumulation. So what is, uh, we are buried in this neutral term, livelihoods. Now, I can understand if you are doing, dealing mainly with small farmers uh, and you are trying to improve incomes, etc., then the use of the term is fine. But when I see these global initiatives that talk about managing landscapes, then I am very deeply concerned about uh, this, uh, you know, this homogenizing term uh, that uh, dis cannot distinguish between regions for indigenous people, regions of, uh, you know, long-standing agrarian systems that are uh, still steeped in semi-feudal practices. So there's a huge variety, and whether there is this umbrella term that comes from above, so it seems to us, uh, however much it may appeal to communities, uh, what do we do with it? And uh, it makes me quite uncomfortable. So is this uh, somewhere picking up where Amit started? Thank you. Chair, uh, we'll have uh, the response from them quickly, and then we'll go. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sara, you would like to respond to that? Sure, thank you very much for the, those comments. And actually, uh, the first comment was, I think, equally addressing the whole landscape question and the institutional question. I do strongly believe um, uh, that the institutional question is at the core. It's what allows us to implement the innovations that were discussed here today, to make them actually happen, not in one community or in five communities, but to occur over millions and millions of, of farmers or fishers or local community actors and businesses and others acting in the landscape. So I wanted to clarify that when I'm referring to these landscape partnerships, um, it isn't about anybody controlling all of the land. It's that in a particular landscape where there's really important declines happening, for example, in water availability across the landscape, if you're going to restore the, the, a river to be year-round uh, flowing water and, uh, and water available for farmers, water available for communities, water available for, for, for processing plants, for, uh, for settlements of people, you're going to have to have the forest owners, the farmers, the small towns, the infrastructure builders, they're all going to need to change their practices and coordinate to get revegetation across the entire landscape if you're going to restore that. So it's not, a, it's really about voluntary collaborative action and negotiation among the different groups, which means that we not only need some loose institutions around the landscape or the territory, there's many different versions of this, of course, but we also need, farmers need to be able to have their voice within this, and that addresses the inequality question that was done, uh, that, that was mentioned before. But I think it's, it's, you don't use a landscape approach if you don't need one. 
that if there are really strong interactions between different parts of the land and land users in the landscape, you need some mechanism over the long term to align the activities that are going on in that. And that's really the approach for, for the landscape partnerships. And in some places, those initiatives are facilitated by local trusted NGOs, local trusted universities. If they're trusted local government act actors, it really depends on the local area. But I think we need to think really seriously about what is the institutional framework to empower local people. I loved what you said before to build their own destiny, to create and craft their own destiny, not just the farmers having their own destiny and their neighboring uh, forest owners having a different destiny that conflicts, but finding a way for them to, to be aligned. I think this is the big strategy, the big challenge for addressing in a holistic way all of the sustainable development goals, and it is not easy. <laughs> so. Oh, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, we can, uh, yeah. We, maybe, you know, any response to Dr. Amit, uh, question uh, dr notial or piyush you have any uh, any views on that yeah uh, so I, I i would like to but i was not able to hear very clearly okay so if, if some quick points are there to be to be addressed from my perspective i'll be very happy to participate in this webinar I have I have one addition to what uh, Dr. Sara has said. Yeah, please. Uh, so especially in the coastal regions, uh, whenever uh, we take up some livelihood activity, uh, especially in the form of seaweed culture or anything, there is always a sort of restriction from the forest department who owns most of, who controls rather most of these areas, and there is no clear policy as to. Uh, whether that can be taken up and to what extent we can do it and uh, you know who will be the regulatory body and all such things are there so if we address that issue we will be able to you know uh, expand the livelihood options that are available to the uh, coastal fisher folk uh, rather than just putting too much of pressure on the coastal areas only for fishing so this is one thing that has been there for a long time and we have to come with a sort of coordinated efforts to address this issue without which we will not be able to give this as a life thing option for us. Thank you. This is what I would like to say. I think these are the great general guidelines and at the micro level we have to evolve a suitable system. If it is workable, well and good, otherwise you need to modify it. So these are the things to be, cannot be literally implemented in every place. This is the guideline. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Any more questions? So yes. I would like to add one point here, uh, uh, Professor Hagde. Yes. I have one small, uh, yes. uh, just one point, which I feel is very burning. The point is that, uh, you know, research organizations like us or the universities are, are having enough potential and, uh, and capabilities to, to, to do something new and to innovate uh, better things uh, for the development of hill and mountains or mountains or coastal ecosystems. But the point here is that we do innovation at very micro level, and scaling up is the big, big problems. And basic innovate and upscale. Upscale is big failure, and failure is that because of one major reason, and which is lack of coordination among the line departments, line ministries, and they still we we are lagging behind as far as integration, transdisciplinarity, and interdisciplinarity is concerned in this country. And this is a big issue, and I don't know how to over. I'm also struggling a lot how to overcome. For example, I would like to make one clear. Our institute has done a great work in Himalayan region, particularly to control the forest fire. And forest fire is one of the major reasons for large forest fire in Himalayan region is the leaf litter, which comes down from the pine tree, pine needles. And in one state, for example, in Uttarakhand, 5,000 square kilometers under pine trees, pine plantation, and which produces 13 million pine needles in a year. And these are fire prone, you know, litters on the ground. And we have innovated that how this resource, which is not so good for the ecosystem health, could be used sustainably, sustainably to be linked to the societal development, livelihood development, and models are developed. For example, Lots of products are being made and which are very much accepted and appreciated by the stakeholders. 
But unfortunately, the point here is that nobody is there to upscale us at a very regional level or a state level. This is point one. Another thing, we have uh, uh, used these pine needles for developing the, the, uh, the uh, fire briquettes. Uh, fire briquette. And one briquette is just is able to provide 2008 uh, kilocalorie equivalent to energy and could be could be uh, could be uh, burning for one hour where a small family can just uh, cook their meal and this has lots of implications one is one is i just would like to summarize one is reduce tremendous state attitude in the air pollution and also reduce the anthropogenic pressure on the uh, available local resources uh, in the mountains but the point here is that how to take this to the each and every users here is the problem Okay, Here, okay. I think Dr. Dr. got it. Then only we'll have, otherwise, we will keep on going to discuss the issues again and again yes, yes. without having proper implementation on the ground. Thank uh, you so very due much. Due to for the paucity of time, I would like to conclude by saying that you know there are issues where uh, you know government community interfacing. Probably we take this as a recommendation to say that you know we need better dialogue with the community understanding to see how we can come to an amicable situation without disturbing the ecosystem, how the community can prosper. That's one thing. Secondly, there are micro level success stories. How do we make it widely replicable? That's a burning question. And uh, it's also, it has been spoke, uh, talked, I mean, government also has a habit of not looking to this. So we, this is again, we need to, I, to recommend that, you know, there are success stories which need to be studied presented and, you know, share with the government and other institutions as to how to make it a larger scale replicability. Uh, because with time, we are running out. So thank you very much for all the speakers. Sarah, I met you long ago in Ikrisat, 1989-90. Good to see you. Again. I remember well. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. for. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you, Sarah. Luck. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you, um, and just uh, share, giving us uh, some, you know, uh, compliments from the thing. Yeah, right. So thank you everybody for um, uh, this session. We will meet tomorrow, of course, at 10 a.m. for the uh, last day of the conference. But in the meantime, I have uh, an important announcement. So every year, the Rotary Club of uh, Madras East and Cabin Care Private Limited. They institute an award in the name of uh, Professor Swaminathan. It's called the Dr. M. S. Swaminathan Award for Environment Protection. And this year, the recipient is Dr. K. Kesavalu, and he is the president of ISTA Zurich, uh, New Zealand, and also the managing director of the Telangana State Sea 